Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in learning more about what it takes to be a successful nonprofit leader and how to breathe life into a dream, then this is the episode for you because my next guest did just that when he established the Grameen Foundation way back in 1997 with the support of Nobel laureate Dr. Mohammed Yunus when he was only 29 years old. Not Muhammad Yunus, but Alex Counts. And before I introduce you to him, I want to make sure you've signed up to get a free copy of the Just Brew It ebook. It has amazing career advice from some of the incredible professionals who've been guests on T4C, including Guy Raz, the NPR journalist and host of the top rated How I Built This podcast, and Dr. Janet Yellen, the former chairwoman of the Federal Reserve Bank. And it is super easy to do, my friends. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org. And you'll see the sign up box right there on the homepage. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Alex Counts, a guiding voice in the nonprofit and microfinance community and author of the new book, When in Doubt, Ask for More, and 213 Other Life and Career Lessons for the Mission-Driven Leader. In 1997, almost 25 years ago, Alex established the Grameen Foundation, with the support of Nobel laureate Dr. Mohammed Yunus, and he became its president and CEO when he was only 29 years old. The foundation's mission was and is to enable poor, especially poor women, to lift themselves out of poverty. It was how they went about doing that that captured headlines and accolades the world over. Alex established the foundation after he worked in microfinance and poverty reduction for 10 years while he was living in rural Bangladesh. And he started the Grameen Foundation with a $6,000 seed grant provided by Professor Yunus, who was a founding board member, and he continues to be a director emeritus. The Grameen Foundation has grown to become a leading international humanitarian organization, and Alex ran the foundation for almost 20 years before he stepped down in 2015. To this day, he remains a friend and volunteer of the foundation. But at the present time, in addition to writing books and articles, Alex works as a private consultant to nonprofit organizations and social enterprises. And he's also an adjunct professor at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland College Park. Alex, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you still caffeinated on English breakfast tea and ready to go? I sure am. Wonderful. Well, I was thinking before we get into the meat of what you did as the founder and CEO of the Grameen Foundation, perhaps we should give a little bit of a 101 overview to our young listeners who may not be as familiar with what microfinance is, with what microfinance institutions, MFIs are, and perhaps who Dr. Eunice is as well. When I was at college, I was influenced by a time kind of honored piece of wisdom, which is that every problem in the world has been solved somewhere, but those solutions have not gone to the logical scale. They haven't reached everyone who they could reach. And and so you had macro problems and micro solutions. And I was looking for one of those micro solutions and, and microfinance seemed to fit the bill. Basically, the approach is to say that, you know, a lot of poor people have, you you look at all their deficits, they don't have education, as much education as people typically do in their society. They don't have a good quality housing, they don't have much in way of income or assets, but they do have survival skills. There's something that they're doing 
that is keeping them alive. And it's and oftentimes it's not that they have a job; it's that they're some doing some sort of small business or entrepreneurial venture. And Muhammad Yunus and a few others in the '70s had the insight that if we were to provide not so much training or not so much trying to fill the deficits, but just put some capital behind those tiny businesses, those survival skills, and let them self-empower themselves, you'd start a virtuous cycle. And over time, we learned that not only that, you could get almost all of the loans back if you develop the right incentives. And in fact, their businesses were profitable enough that you could charge interest it would pay for the cost of delivering the loans. And it was among many other insights, giving the loans to women as opposed to men seemed to work better. The whole family benefited, but the woman was the liaison with the financial institution. And over time, we went. people went from thinking that poor women of the world were an invisible market for the world's financial institutions to them realizing that they were a very vibrant market if you learned how to serve them effectively. And that was the birth of the modern microfinance movement, which has went through many changes and evolutions, but that's the core lesson. And it was you know, early practitioners, Professor Yunus in Bangladesh, there was a Pancho Artero in Bolivia, a few other pioneers, and El Abad in India. And now it's really gone mainstream. How did you learn about Dr. Yunus? You went to school in the mid-1980s. This was well before the internet? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I, I have to credit some of my fellow students in high school and college who tried to raise money for Oxfam America in high school. I did very little to help them, but I watched them. And then there were students protesting against apartheid at Cornell and Columbia, which started a kind of a national movement. And they scratched my kind of social conscience and it got me thinking. And I joined a group that still is working today. It's 40 years old. It's called Results. It's a citizens grassroots movement around ending poverty. It's kind of a secular version of Bread for the World that some of your colleagues may know, It's a Christian, which is a Christian movement, social justice movement working on a global poverty and hunger. And they would just present solutions. And then you would advocate for bills in Congress that would build on those solutions. And one of the solutions they brought to us to advocate for was what we now call microfinance. While vaccinations and vitamin A supplementation, which they worked on, made a lot of sense, a complete solution seemed to be microfinance. And so I just studied it as most I could and made a career out of it. We are doing this interview right now at the end of May 2020. And of course, that means we're right in the middle of college graduation season. You graduated from Cornell University in 1988. And while you were still an undergrad, you wrote a letter to <laughs> Dr. Yunus. What year were you? And as I said, this was way before the internet. So it wasn't like you could email him. And mm -hmm. what did you say in that letter? Well, I've, I've tried to actually, I, I have the letter he sent me back in response and I found in my files a few years ago, but I think fortunately the original letter has been lost because, you know, I, it was, it was an idea proposed by a mentor of mine who became a lifelong friend who kind of saw a potential in me to be a liaison with Grameen that hadn't really existed before. There were no other foreigners that had spent more than maybe a week or two there. And he, he saw that potential in me. And on a Friday, he mentioned to me, and when I was a junior doing the, something called the Cornell and Washington program, an internship, and he wrote it on a, mentioned it on a Friday, and I spent the whole weekend obsessing about the letter, and I sent it on Monday after I showed it to him to kind of proofread and comment on. And basically, the letter, as best I can remember, I was saying, Professor Yunus, you've developed this amazing innovation, and I want to commit my life to helping you spread it all around the world. And I probably overestimated or exaggerated my skills and ability to help him do so in my attempt to get him interested. And I sent the letter not knowing what would happen. But six weeks later, he sent a response, which I, again, I, I have to this day. And there's a wariness to his response, but I didn't focus on that. I focused on the fact that he answered and that he invited me when I completed my studies to come join him and that they would try to find some interesting work for me that would help them grow internationally. And again, I spent the better part of 30 years following that idea you know, with his support. And didn't he also say, you're welcome to come, but you need to study Bangladeshi first? 
Yeah, he got kind of like really to the point. He said, if you want to do a, a week-long visit to check this off on your resume, fine. A lot of the educated Bangladeshi speak English. But if you really want to figure out what's going on in Grameen, you should try to learn uh, Bengali if you can before you get here. And so I never, I'd never done well at foreign languages, but it turned out Cornell was one of five universities in the country at that time that taught Bengali as a four-credit course. And I enrolled immediately and finally found, a, if not a gift, at least a capabilities that I hadn't really realized yet around foreign languages. And by the time I arrived, I was speaking so-so Bengali that over the years then became very good. But yeah, he was already trying to take me seriously and set me up for success, but also challenged me to work really hard. And, and those would be themes of our relationship for years and to this present day. Well, thank you for correcting me. I should have said Bengali. This reminds me about Many, many, many years ago, when I asked somebody if they spoke Israeli. So mm. uh, clearly, it is <laughs> Bengali and not Bangladeshi. So you got a ticket and you just hopped on a plane and flew to Bangladesh? Not exactly. I, you know, one of the best lessons that anyone has ever taught me, and as someone who's a cross between an introvert and extrovert, the lesson was figure out what you want. And this is any domain of life. Figure out what you want. Get proud of it because, you know, that you, you don't be ashamed of it or even if it seems a little unusual. And then and then start asking people to help you realize it. But you'll be surprised how many people want to. So when I started talking to everyone around this idea at the beginning of my senior year, a professor said, well, if you thought about applying for a Fulbright Fellowship? And I said, what's a Fulbright Fellowship? The due date for the application was like two weeks on. But it's like, well, thank you, Professor Uphoff. And I got it in. I'm embarrassed to read that Fulbright essay today, both for the spelling mistakes and for the grandiosity. And But it was good enough to get me a Fulbright. And that was basically they were paying the costs for me to spend nine months in Bangladesh to undertake my project, which was to help develop an international program of Grameen. So one of the frustrating things is I needed to go through a little bureaucracy because I wasn't totally on my own. And my trip was delayed a few months as a result, which I find infinitely frustrating. But finally, the December, six months after I graduated Cornell, I got on a plane and, and I spent almost a year there. And then everything else just kind of followed from that. But the Fulbright program is a great way, along with some other ways to get overseas and to learn, to contribute, to build your network. And uh, Fulbright played that role for me. It is. It's an amazing opportunity. I wish I had known about it back when I was in college in the mid 80s. But apparently they give out 8,000 scholarships to American students, both in undergrad and graduate school every year mm -hmm. to go pretty much anywhere in the world. I think there are 140 countries, all expenses paid to study, to work, to learn. So what did you do when you arrived in Bangladesh and did you have a bigger plan of action? Well, it was it was somehow it's in certain ways embarrassingly simplistic at that time, but that's okay. I I first realized I probably spent the first few months which was smart in retrospect just immersing myself in everything about Grameen because if I was going to help take this idea global, I needed to really understand what that idea was, not at a surface level, but at a very deep level. There were these traditional branches, there were maybe 500 at the time, that you know were typical ones where the international visitors went to. They were close to Dhaka, they convenient, they maybe had an English-speaking branch manager. And I was sent to very different ones, way out in the boondocks, and just was not there for an afternoon little photo op, but there to really immerse myself. And that paid off. I mean, I was always worried I wasn't fulfilling my Fulbright obligations, but they're really hands off. And then in the second half of my time, I began to do things, whether it's just serving, sometimes it is a kind of a personal assistant to Muhammad Yunus. I started an international newsletter, which is still published to this day for Grameen, kind of its international network of people who were applying its ideas in other countries. And I was the first editor of that, I translated some things that were only at that time in Bengali into English and then added some things I thought would be useful for international visitors that wouldn't be needed for a, a local person. And so I started to put some of the building blocks together that would ultimately evolve into Grameen had a you know international training division. They created an organization called Grameen Trust. They were logical extensions of things that I began to put in place during the second half of my Fulbright. But you stayed in Bangladesh longer oh, yeah. than your Fulbright. Well, I stayed for 
10 months, whereas the Fulbright was for nine. I, sh- I should have, I actually, there's a way to extend a nine month Fulbright five additional months that I didn't even know about. I wish I did. But what I did is I came back and I worked for three years in the US with an organization that is closely aligned with Ramin called Results, which is a citizens advocacy group working on international poverty issues. But then I, I felt a tug to kind of complete my work in Bangladesh. And so I went back for five additional years, which was basically the second half of my 20s. So it was six years total, but the Fulbright was separated from the other five by some time where I was back in the US. And, and again, that worked well to kind of round out my training and apprenticeship during my 20s for when I went to then start Grameen Foundation around turning 30. So how did you go about starting the Grameen Foundation in the US? And why did you think there was a need for a Grameen Foundation? Well, I had tried to... I mean, I I wish I could say it was some master plan that came through a very rigorous process, but it's more random than that, as life often is. When I was there for that second stint, I helped try to raise some money for this organization called Grameen Trust, which was set up by Professor Yunus to be the international arm of Grameen. And what we learned is is that, well, we raised some money. I, I raised a $2 million grant from the U.S. government, or at least was part of a team that did that, I should say, but had the initial meetings with USAID. But it turned out that in general, if you wanted to raise money in, let's say, the United States, which is a very philanthropically oriented and a lot of sympathy and and affinity for Grameen's approach, you really needed to be here. People wanted to help Grameen get going in Ghana to send money to Bangladesh to go to Ghana, where at that point, especially people didn't look to Bangladesh as a place that could have capabilities that we in the U.S. didn't have, even though that was true. So we just if you wanted to serious mobilize the goodwill of people in the US to support Grameen growing internationally, you needed to have a presence here. You needed to have a nonprofit registered with the IRS, but you needed a team here that could serve as that liaison. And so I think Professor Yunus had that insight around the same time I did. The citizens kind of movement to back microcredit was growing. And so after a big conference that was a huge success. He said, okay, this is our time to set up a little liaison office beachhead in the U.S., and and I want you to run it. And while I felt totally underprepared in so many ways, of course, I jumped at it and was able to slowly build it to be a a respectable organization that I think advanced the Grameen ideals and techniques on a global basis and gave people here who wanted to be part of that and a way to do it that was easy and and enjoyable and uh, satisfying. Let's rewind the clock just a teeny bit because Mm -hmm. to go from the tiny seed grant that you got from Dr. Yunus of $6,000 and grow it into the massive oak tree that it really has become, there's obviously a lot of learning in between. How did you do it? Well, I would say I did it through just trying a lot of things, making a lot of mistakes, fortunately, none of them fatal, learning from those mistakes and surrounding myself with mentors and working very, very hard. I mean, I I talk about some of the middle chapters in my book, Changing the World Without Losing Your Mind. One of the chapters titled Running My Own Show. I didn't know what I didn't know about running a nonprofit, but I just did everything I could. I make the joke, which is true, that if I go to the bathroom you know, I wouldn't walk. I would kind of jog back to my desk because I would shave off a few seconds that I could be spent working because especially with my limited skills at the time, just that putting in long hours was a way to move things forward despite my own limitations. And one of the ways I wrote that book is I, I write about all the things that I ultimately learned about building a nonprofit, but that I wish I would have learned earlier. But I got enough things right. I had people starting to look out for me and cover for me when I made mistakes and celebrate with me when I did things right. So yeah, so we barely raised $100,000 that first year. And then we grew it ultimately to be about a $20, $25 million organization. And I'd say the biggest single insight how to grow it, I mean, attract really good people. But also, I just learned to embrace fundraising, not as a necessary evil, but as a really just fun way to develop partnerships with people that allow you and them to implement your things that excite you to do things that excite you about improving society. And so learning to love fundraising, learning how to attract and motivate 
idealistic, talented people. I just got a little better at that every year. And that just starts to create a virtuous cycle. Well, speaking of fundraising, you have a great story about when you first met with George Soros, the (laughs) Greek-American philanthropist. Will you share that with our listeners? Sure. I actually only got to meet him once a couple of years later. But what I was able to do, Muhammad Yunus asked me to raise $10.6 million for a project that turned out to be extremely successful, but he had a big cash need at that time. And, you know, I, I had no fundraising skills. My organization was about to run out of money. It was just early weeks, not even months of Green Foundation. But I got in front of his newly appointed foundation president, Arya Nair. And I was so nervous, but you overcome that. And I I tell the story of pitching this project to him. He was a very impassive kind of guy. I didn't know if I was getting through, but he asked me one point how much money the project needed. And I was really deeply uncomfortable with whether it was appropriate to ask for $10.6 million in a first meeting. And someone, you know, I barely was 30 years old. He'd been prior to that, the head of Human Rights Watch. I mean, a major human rights organization. And I just, is this protocol etiquette? Am I, am I, is he going to laugh at me? Whatever. You know how it is when some people, you ask them a question they know the answer to, but they're deeply uncomfortable about the answer. Yeah. And so they kind of meander around it and apologize for the answer. And I hope you aren't offended and all that. As a fundraiser, you're just kind of cutting your legs out from under yourself to ask, as I sometimes say, apologetically or hesitantly. And so some part of me knew that what I needed to do was just answer the man's question, $10.6 million, as if it was a a reasonable thing to ask. It was factually true. He'd invited me in and we went on, the conversation went a bit further. And if you fast forward a year, the 10.6 million was raised. Ari and I's wife was on our board as vice chair and he and his wife had begun making personal financial donations that George Soros triple matched, as I think he did for all of his employees which went on more than a decade. The big lesson from that that I, uh, and this is one of these stories I used to tell people I was mentoring and I just wanted to make it available to more people through my book. If I'd answered that basic question of what money I needed with a sense of apology or hesitancy or being ashamed of it or uncomfortable with it, I don't think we get the money. I don't think his wife joins the board. I don't think we get also their personal financial support because I was just, again, I I was kind of undercutting what the partnership that I was wanting to develop with him and with Mr. Soros. And you just, your credibility just collapses, I think. And so I, you know, wasn't yet a good fundraiser, but that was a good in the moment decision that led to some pretty exciting things down the road. Terrific. So outside of fundraising, what were some of your other responsibilities while you were at the helm of the foundation over 18 years? One of the things I feel best about is we built a really good board of directors and not just one with a lot of rich people on it. There were some really rich people on it, but it was diverse, not just ethnically or gender wise, but in just professions and the way people thought of the world and political views and just how it it was a board that asked the tough questions, but always in a respectful collegial way. I think most boards are dysfunctional either because they micromanage or they're just asleep at the wheel. But that, that just takes hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of conversations with board members to to see the organization through their eyes and to create a positive experience for them. And another thing I did is I would have lots of conversations in small groups and one-on-one with my employees and other volunteers who weren't on the board, again, to try to get a sense, to communicate them my vision and why I did the things that I did, but really more than that, to see the organization through their eyes. You know, I, I might see a certain program or a certain policy in a good light and then to just understand that two thirds of my employees saw it in a negative light might not change my view, but at least I, I like realize that. And people don't divulge that to you till you develop trust and you show interest and then you don't overreact when they tell you deliver news you don't want. And I, there's also I just a lot of travel to see the work at the field level, to meet with government officials who sometimes could be allies or, or could put major obstacles in the view. And probably more than most people in my rule, I, you know, I like to write. I like to publish about what I was learning and not, not so much about what we were accomplishing, not just bragging, but more about what we were learning. Because, you know, we get certain tax advantages being a nonprofit. So one of the ways I feel we, we should pay back society for giving us those advantages is when we do things that work or don't work is to share our intellectual property with the wider philanthropic and business and nonprofit community so they can benefit from insights that we've had either from successes or failures. 
Wonderful. I I just want to finish so that our listeners realize just how large your footprint was, because even though the Grameen Bank was operating in Bangladesh when it began, the footprint included Latin America, the Middle East, other parts of Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So pretty darn significant. In your latest book, Alex, entitled When in Doubt, Ask for More and 213 Other Life and Career Lessons for the Mission-Driven Leader. What do you think some of the most important lessons are, maybe just a handful of them, that you'd like to share with our young listeners who may still be a few years away from being those mission-driven leaders, but could still be relevant nonetheless in the early days of their careers? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the lesson from which the book draws its title, When in Doubt, Ask for More, is a lot of people who are not experienced in fundraising, they, again, they feel that fundraising is a zero-sum transaction where they're trying to talk someone out of their money and leaving them with less and the fundraiser with more. And so they say, well, I, I don't, I don't want to impose on them too much. And I say that's just a wrong way of looking at fundraising. And, and there's a whole other lesson around that. But I said, listen, develop a robust, exciting partnership. And that probably is going to be asking for more than you would initially be comfortable with. Take a risk, make it exciting for everyone involved. And they're not obligated to say yes, but why not put in front of them your biggest, your most exciting vision of the partnership and you can go down from there. But if you if you start at a low level, maybe you'll end up not being their favorite charity, but their fourth favorite charity. And, and the, the one that was more ambitious became their top one. So you should always want to be the person's top philanthropic interest. You know, you mentioned something to me once about the importance of not burning bridges. And I, I certainly agree with that. But one of the things, one of the lessons in the book that's a little less intuitive is I talk about, it's okay to make a few enemies. By which I mean, I think sometimes people are so cautious in what they say, the positions they take, the principles that they defend. I once got myself kicked off a nonprofit board as a matter of principle because I I believe that good governance was more important than being collegial or going along to get along. And there's still some relationships that haven't recovered from that. But I just believe that take some risks, be spontaneous, and some you're going to turn some people off. And that's okay because as long as you, first of all, true to yourself and you make sure that the people that you develop positive relationships with, make them really positive make them really positive for you and for them. And if you have 80 relationship, professional relationships that are just really great, that people will do anything for you and you do anything for them. And if there are 10 that aren't in such good shape, I think that's a, that's a decent exchange. If you're trying never to offend anyone, you also won't develop those super robust relationships quite as honestly. So uh, you, one could disagree, but that's something I've come to think. I've, I've also come to believe that This is in both books, but I I talk about the power of always being engaged in something that you're a novice at, which is usually a hobby, but it could be a new part of your profession that you're not that skilled at. Because I think that, you know, the tendency as we get older is we navigate towards things that we have competence in or that comfort us. Think of like watching reruns of a TV show you like or doing something that you're good at professionally. And besides that and family and sleeping, that's it. And by doing something that you're a novice at, that you're, you're not good at, but you put yourself around people that are, because that's how you get out of being a novice, you kind of look foolish a lot. You make a lot of mistakes, you're, you know, and that, and that I think keeps you playful and humble and in a learning mode rather than in a kind of a self-satisfaction mode that I think seeps into every aspect of your life. If you're doing something that you're a novice at, then you think about, how could I be better at being a husband? How can I be better at being a leader? How can I be a better fundraiser? I might be good, but I can be better because I know in the novice area, and I know how much fun it can be once you embrace the adventure of it, of just being bad at something, sucking at something, but being around people that are good, which helps you develop into a new skill. So those are some of the things, just technical things about fundraising. You know, If you're in a fundraising meeting, for the most part, If you're going to ask someone for money, which you don't always do when you're with a donor, I think it usually makes sense to get the ask out, including a dollar amount, in the first five to ten minutes of a meeting. Really? And I kind of, I I kind of, and I briefly, yeah, people tend to, I did, people tend to, you know, they're nervous about the ask because what if the person says no? So they spend like, of an hour meeting, they spend 50 minutes building up to it and trying to create this art, you know, which you should have been doing in some degree beforehand. 
But the person's like, well, where is this all going? And then you get to the end and you finally get over your fear and you say, we want a million dollars. Well, the meeting is almost over. So you've got now only 10 minutes to negotiate the million dollars. Well, million dollars over what time period? For what uses? What staff are going to be involved? Well, you're out of time. Rather, if it's a meeting where you're coming to ask, be up front. Or as one of my mentors said about giving speeches, start with your conclusion. Don't build up to what the main message. Give that at the beginning and then say, okay, now I'm going to tell you how I got there. So it relaxes people. People know where you, what you want. If you're asking for a million dollars, they might just say yes, and then you can just you can celebrate that we're going to put out a press release about this. Or they might just say no, in which case you have the rest of the meeting to say, okay, well, what would interest you? Uh, is it what we're asking for? Is it the amount? And then you walk away with 50 minutes of kind of an operating manual from the donor of what they might say yes to either a million dollars or some other amount for something that they are passionate about. So get the ask out and let them, if it's a solicitation meeting, spend the meeting in negotiation with your objective on the table early on so you can spend time figuring out if it makes sense rather than trying to kind of put out every last argument about it. But the person's there, but where is this going? It it just, it confuses and frustrates people, I find. Yeah, absolutely. What fantastic advice. You've mentioned now on multiple occasions, Alex, the mentors that you've had. Mm, Yeah. How do you recommend our young listeners go about finding mentors and then cultivating them? Well, I think that one of the most powerful things in fundraising, and I'll get back to mentorship, is, you know, people are like, I want to develop a relationship with this wealthy businessman to give me money. So I, I, you know, I want to show him how smart I am, show him that we do great work. And there's a place for that. But I think one of the biggest ways to build rapport with people and to draw them in is to ask them for advice. And it's humbling. It's saying, I don't know everything I need to know, but maybe you do. And they feel like they're not just an ATM to you as a donor, but they're actually like a thought partner and you're valuing what they may have learned in business or philanthropy or academia or whatever disciplines or even in their parenting that could be helpful to you. People sometimes think that that shows weakness from the fundraiser or the leader. Uh, And I think it shows humility and strength and curiosity and a willingness to work in a partnership. And so for me, mentoring, whether it's formally like, will you be a mentor for me? for the rest of my life or for a defined period or sometimes just developing that kind of relationship where you're continually asking people questions that you really want the answer to and you think they might have better answers than you do, which is for almost everyone is flattering. Even if they, they feel like, oh, gosh, I don't have a lot of, to add, but you thought I did. And let's think about something I way I can be helpful to you. And the thing that's been striking to me is once you get into that mode of curiosity of asking people for advice and flattering them, but also getting their good advice is that just how rarely people that I've asked to mentor me or advise me have said no. It's just people at a certain stage of their career, and I'm at that stage now, is, you know, you want to give back. You've learned a lot and you want to be helpful to someone who's in the shoes you were in 10 or 20 or 30 years before so that your insights don't die with you. I tell the story in one of my books. I said, you know, John C. Whitehead, who was a famous philanthropist and business leader, former deputy secretary of state of the U.S., the United States government, he was mentoring me once, which I just was shocked that he agreed to do. And he, I mean, he would like call me from vacations, which I don't think he did. I mean, just but one time he called me and he was tasked by the, the governor at the time, Governor Pataki, to help rebuild lower Manhattan after 9-11, after the collapse of the World Trade Centers. And I'm sitting with him 20 minutes into a mentoring session, and his secretary said, oh, Governor Pataki's on the line, uh, Mr. Whitehead. And I'm like, huh, well, <laughs> this session's over. Um, <laughs> and the guy, uh, no, no joke, he said, well, tell the governor I'll call him back. I'm in with Alex. I was like 35 years old. I'm like, holy my God, he is so committed to – helping me become a better professional, answer my thoughtful questions about things, leading organizations effectively, that he would keep the governor of the state of New York waiting, cooling his heels for a couple hours so he could do this with me in his office. I was flabbergasted, but it was an insight of so many people in that second half of their careers want to give back, want to be asked for advice, want a mentor. And if you you have the courage to ask them to do that, and then you're thoughtful about You don't show up unprepared, but you ask them really good questions 
and really apply what they tell you that is seems worth applying. It won't, won't be everything. They're going to get out of, as much out of it as you, if not more. Oh my gosh. Amazing advice. And I want to underscore something that you just slipped in there at the end. Make sure you show up prepared because if you have asked someone to be a mentor, make sure that you do your homework, make sure that you come to them with really thoughtful questions and you're not wasting their time. Mm -hmm. And when they, I'll tell you, and the one other point just to reemphasize it is if I ask Mr. Whitehead, I mean, who passed away some years ago and I wrote a a tribute to him on our blog because he was from a political, very different place. And we were different in so many ways, but he just took that time to mentor me. If I walk out of there and I said, he gives me five pieces of advice and I decide to really apply two of them for as long as I'm applying that advice that first came from him, or maybe I heard from several mentors, similar things, I would go back to him while he was living and frequently would say that thing you said to me seven years ago, I, tr- I used it again last week and it worked. Mm. And, you know, I've tracked people down, gone to some lengths because I'm not taking them for granted. I'm letting them know, yes, I didn't apply everything you recommended, but the ones I did, I did it with real discipline and effort and it worked. And I'm going to give you the satisfaction of knowing that it worked. And just that little step that so many people don't take or they take it in a kind of half-hearted way. I just have always done that and how meaningful it is to people, how much their loyalty to me grows and they want to roll up their sleeves again and help me. It's just, it's so easy, but it's, it's often neglected. Oh, I love that. That is so heartwarming to hear that. Just a couple final questions for you, Alex. I'm going to skip over one of the questions that I try to ask all my guests because we obviously know the answer to it. And that is, did you know what you were going to do with your economics degree when you graduated in 1988? The answer is yes, you got a Fulbright and you went to Bangladesh. You've obviously had an incredibly successful professional life, but we both know because we have a number of years on our odometer that just because someone is successful doesn't mean they haven't experienced failure because they aren't mutually exclusive. In fact, I believe that often you don't have one without the other. So could you share a time in your professional life, Alex, when you struggled? Maybe you even failed at something. And most importantly, how you persevered and if there was a lesson that you learned in the process. One of the things that people... One of my former board chairs who read my book, Changing the World Without Losing Your Mind, people have said this others in different ways is, you know, Alex, you were too hard on yourself, which is I think that they meant that I spent too much time talking about failures that I'd experienced. But the reason I told them is because I also learned something valuable. But, you know, a lot of people are shocked that I'm so candid about these failures that very few people would have known about them unless I include them, but they helped me learn. And, and they were both failures that I let down the organization or sometimes that I let down myself. I talk about, for example, the early years of Grameen Foundation, I pushed myself so hard that my mental and physical and emotional and spiritual health was severely compromised. And again, some of my early mentors almost viewed that as a badge of honor that they were sacrificing their well-being for the good of the cause. But I came to believe that that was misguided. I, I, I came to believe that you can actually take care of yourself. And I spent the, actually the last third of my book changing the world without losing your mind. And many of the lessons in When in Doubt, Ask for More are about how do you care for yourself so that you emerge, despite how hard you're working and the setbacks, that it doesn't come, that each year you're a little bit healthier emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally. But it took me almost bombing out and burning out uh, early in my career to get serious about that. The financial crises of 2001 and 2010 were very hard. 2008, 9, 10 were very hard for Mean Foundation because A, it was harder to raise money, and B, those external shocks kind of shine the spotlight on some bad decisions and issues in your organization that were not so visible when things were riding high. And so dealing with layoffs and dealing with needing to rein in programs that were effective, but you didn't have the money for anymore. Going through those times, you wake up in the morning and you're not jumping out of bed with excitement. It's just, you know, how do you weather this this latest round? But again, the chock full of, you want to see the greatest hits of my mistakes and they're woven in these books in a way I don't think is often the case for nonprofit leaders. But I try to 
using mentors who could both give me a pep talk when I needed it, but also help me to see the learning in the mistake and in the failure. And mentors of mine were extremely helpful. And, and I found for myself writing about what was happening, sometimes I wouldn't publish the entirety of what I wrote, would just help me process it and, and distill the learnings out and then make me a better professional. You know, I, one of my mantras is everyone knows you should reward success. But what I got, what I taught myself and what one of my mentors taught me is that it's often just as important to reward failure. Because if you fail at something, especially if it's really a big project and it's, and it's embarrassing and humiliating, if you do the work of figuring out where your plan was flawed and where your mental model of what was needed for success was flawed, you're going to emerge as a better professional. And the lessons you learn in decoding, unpacking your failures, those aren't lessons that you forget about. They get seared into your consciousness and you're, you're like, it's almost like you're immune. It's like you're vaccinated against making that mistake again because it's not conceptual, it's experiential. So when I failed, they just kind of built me up, but just made sure I learned the lessons and I spent my career, quote unquote, rewarding failure as long as the person was willing to learn the lesson. That was applied to me and apply, I applied it to others and I have very few regrets, even though it sounds like a pretty counterintuitive approach. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Alex, and, and for writing these books and putting yourself out there because the work that you're doing is part of a marathon that you're running. And that's why it's so important to take care of your spiritual health and doesn't have to involve a higher being. It's your a sense of community, your mental health, your physical health. You need your energy to be able to complete that marathon. Final T for C question. If you could go back to Cornell and do it all over again, but based on the immense wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? I would advise myself to reach out more, find professors who are willing to take an interest in me and form lifelong relationships with them where they would Outside of whatever they're teaching me in the classroom, they could begin to get bought into the journey I was on. I, I did emerge with one such professor, but I think I underutilized that. You know, I was out there running after my girlfriends and my volunteer work and trying to do well in my courses and all that was important. But there were some, just some great people there who would have been willing to advise me and to continue doing so probably for my entire career that I, I left that on the table. I, I would also do a year or a semester abroad to broaden my horizons, to hopefully learn a, a new language and culture. I would advise myself to do that. And a couple courses that I wish I had taken. But, you know, as you're, as you're doing that, you know, you go through some dead ends in life. And sometimes exploring dead ends is at least you can check it off. And I wouldn't be too critical of the courses I took. But in terms of kind of leveraging the willingness of professors to become allies and advocates, I would do it much more. And I'd while I did do Cornell in Washington, which opened a lot of doors, I would have gone outside the country and used that as an opportunity, uh, definitely, that I, I didn't pick up on that. Well, we should also let our listeners know that Alex received the John F. Kennedy Memorial Award given annually by the class of 1964 to the graduating senior who is the best example of the ideal of public service articulated by Cornell's 35th president. And I think we can all see why you got that. Alex's new book is called When in Doubt, Ask for More and 213 Other Life and Career Lessons for the Mission-Driven Leader. His most recent book before that is called How to Change the World Without Losing Your Mind. And if you want to learn how to break into international humanitarian work and or microfinance, please check out the show notes for this episode to see if Alex's Espresso Shots episode has already dropped. Alex, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community and for all of the wisdom that you have put out there, both in your writings in your book, on your blog. We'll include links to all of that. And just for the work that you have done to try to change the world and make it a better place for everyone. 
Well, thank you. Our, our generation, Andrea, has uh, we've solved a lot of problems that we inherited from prior generations, but we've also left a lot. Climate change is just one obvious one. And I admire what you're doing. And I'm trying to play my role of, of build up the next generation of change makers. They don't have to make all the mistakes that we made in trying to make the world a better place, but there's a lot for them to do. And I'm so glad you're out there whatever their profession, but especially if part of it is making positive changes in society that we're trying to build people up, give them uh, insights and help them succeed. And uh, hats off to you too. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.